at some point there is going to be a in a fairly short window of time like call it'll probably be a one to three month span the market is going to say oh wow the flipping is real meaning solely not meaning etptc I, I do think it will happen and then when it happens it will be it'll be pretty quick this episode is brought to you by helium mobile they've created a crypto native phone plan for unlimited talk text and data for just 20 dollars a month we'll chat more about them later in the show Although this episode's guest is a managing partner of a registered investment advisor, nothing in this podcast should be considered an offer of Multicoin's investment advisory services or should otherwise be confused for investment, tax, legal, or other financial advice. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are joined today by Kyle Samani, the managing partner at Multicoin, who has a strong track record of interesting theses. And it's really no secret that he uh, is excited about a future that prioritizes high throughput systems, including Solana. Kyle, the last time we had you on, it was about 10 months ago, the title of the episode was Ending the Modular versus Monolithic Debate. 10 months later, we have certainly not ended that debate, but uh, it does feel like we're making some progress uh, in in either direction nonetheless. But uh, thanks for coming on. We've got an exciting lineup for us today to jam on, but I want to start things off a little bit different than usual. And the question I want to ask to get things moving is like, when somebody who's loosely familiar with maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana asks you, like, what is the core value proposition of building in crypto? How do you respond? Uh, it's the best financial rails to move money around. W- w- one, one thing, zooming out for a second, you know, there's all this discourse of like decentralized identities and computers that make commitments and trust minimized computation and like all these other very abstract constructs. Um, I really think they pollute your your mind of like what what are blockchains? Blockchains are asset ledgers. Um, and if you look at actually the presentation I gave at the MultiCoin Summit last year, I open up my, which was about modular versus integrated. I open up the the presentation asking the question, "What do blockchains do?" And blockchains do really one thing: they keep track of who owns what um, at any block. Like, like a block is static at a moment in time and there's a list of who owns what. Um, and so, you know, like, and then like, there's really two things you can do with a list of who owns what. You can either trade assets or you can make, make a payment. And really, if you think about it, trading assets is just two atomic payments going back, going back and forth. So really all you can do is pay people. Like these, these systems kind of have like one base function. Um, and like these business systems are either nine years old if you're measuring Ethereum or like 14 years old if you're counting from Bitcoin. And like we, we have yet to unlock a use case that is not pre- like um, payments with a couple of very small exceptions like governance voting is like kind of cool and stuff. But everything else basically maps to, to that. Calling these things like computers that make come in and trust minimized compu- computation, all these things, world computer, internet computer. I, I think these terms are actively confusing. Um, these are asset ledgers. They they are financial systems. Um, and they are much better financial systems than the old ones for lots of obvious reasons. Um, and so we focus, you know, our energy and effort on people who recognize the interesting properties of this financial system and are building applications that that can leverage it. With that in mind, is that does that play nicely into the idea of a globally shared state? Right. If fundamentally, if all these things are just asset ledgers, then presumably you not want the state across multiple different ecosystems. Is that kind of how you think about the L1, L2 thesis? Um, uh, kind, kind of. And, and before I jump into that, I also want to want to want to add one other comment, which is there are a bunch of interesting tools like ceramic, table land, filecoin, are we these other things that like those systems they all they may have filecoin and are we happen to have their own asset ledgers. Like those systems are, are clearly pretty functionally distinct. Um, those systems are about like storing large volumes of data. So I would, I would just say that crypto is broader than asset ledgers. Um, I want to be clear about that. And Multicoin is an investor or has invested in all four of those names that I just mentioned, among others who are playing around in that space. Um, 
but, but I think it's important to note, like when we're Solana and Ethereum are very different than are we than ceramic and, and table land. But those, these are like functionally, these systems do functionally different things. Um, and we can come back and touch on those other things if, if you want, but, but th those are, are, are different and those are not blockchains. They are inspired by blockchains, certainly, and they, I, I'd say, tend to reflect the ethos of the crypto ecosystem, but they are functionally not asset ledgers. Um, come back to your question, Murd, of like, well, does the implication that asset ledger means should, should we have like one global asset ledger? Um, I don't, th th that's too clean of a um, conclusion. Uh, the reality is, is you, you can have multiple asset ledgers as long as they're bridged together. The uh, most important uh, asset ledger bridge in the world is between the Fed and all of the banks. Um, right. And obviously, every time you move a wire or do an ACH, then you're hitting the Fed bridge, so to speak, to move money from JP Morgan, the Bank of America. Um, and the way we have scaled uh, financial systems over the last 40 years to support, I don't know, four, five, six billion people or something like that have electronic um, banking today. Um, obviously, there, there is no single um, AWS application that like supports that scale. Um, maybe the Chinese or the Indian ones are, are the closest to that. I'm, ac I'm actually not sure. Uh, w w and I don't appreciate the architectures of the systems, how federated those are internally. I, I, don't, I don't know the details. But um, you can't have asset bridges is, is obviously the, the core point. Um, asset bridges are fine. Um, I think it's improbable that we will have 8 billion people on one asset ledger, um, especially if you start Im imagining that you have IoT devices and cars and other weird things also having private keys that need to move money around. So th that's not going to all fit on one asset ledger, at least not given current uh, extrapolations of Moore's law and law, Nielsen's law, to the best of my understanding, um, absence and breakthroughs in, in hardware. Um, but I think you can get pretty far on one asset ledger. Um, the other problem with bridges is like the historically all bridged asset ledgers, like again, fed to the banks, are all based on trust. That That's the only way it's ever been able to work. And if you look at all of the bridges in crypto, you know, they all, uh, various spectrums of trust in those bridges, um, pretty hard to say any of them are actually trust minimized. Um, even, even the ORU and ZKR flavored bridges, uh, like I wouldn't call those trust tr risk-free because the ORUs are just new, the fraud proofs are new and weird. And with ZKRs, like, dude, there's like a real chance that there's a cryptography bug in these things and they just implode tomorrow. It, it's going to be like three to five years before we can definitively say, well, like before you'll be able to say with a straight face that we have a genuinely trust minimized asset bridge that's that's three to five years away just just given like tail risk with these things because the definition of trust minimized means you have eradicated tail risk um so we're a long ways away from that um there will be multiple asset ledgers but probably one asset ledger can support you, you know in a million tps world which i think is within the realm of physics today uh you, you can support a lot with a million tps i don't know if that means a 500 million people or 3 billion people uh, unclear depends on you know average transactions per day per person but a, a million tps will get us a long way and with that thesis in mind there there's kind of this kind of like breaks into two things in my mind one is like the infrastructure layer and actually building out these rails and these these asset ledgers as you refer to them and the other one is like what gets built on top we're going to get into like a, a robust conversation around the, the infrastructure layer and here at the towards the later part of the episode, but I want to talk about the the application layer on top. Like what I know you mentioned earlier, a couple of your investments that you're excited about, but like what at the application layer, like which verticals are you really really excited about uh, that you crypto rails uniquely empower? Yeah, the two areas we're spending most of our time on at the firm today are stable coins and uh, DPIN and and DPIN, and I'll include DVIN as well in, in that. Um, so those are probably the most two most interesting payment applications we've discovered, or uh, um, I should say, like application layer things of blockchains we've discovered. Um, we continue to follow gaming. Uh, we have one gaming investment called Portals that is actually doing pretty nice. They've been very quietly growing um, and are actually doing quite well. Caught up with the founder this morning, um, but like I'd say, gaming it's still TBD if like it really works. Um, with DPIN and DVIN, I can say pretty confidently it works. With stablecoin payments, we can say very confidently it works. 
So we're, we're spending our time there. Um, around stable coins, there's lots of things to do. Um, there's the basic thing of just like get wallets in the hands of people all over the world. Um, and that is not a homogenous problem. The um, getting wallets in the hands of everyone in the world is inherently regional and local. Um, obviously you're gonna have local governments you got to deal with. Um, I, I, there's one team I met recently that like they're focused on, I think they're called juntas, which are like these group savings programs that are fairly common in LATAM and, and other countries around the world. And like their core thesis is we can get crypto wallets in the hands of people by like building a, basically a junta as a smart contract um, in on a blockchain. And there's other people focusing on this in different you know places. So, you know, there's really hundreds of, should be hundreds of venture scale opportunities, I think, um, for, for teams focused on the right ways to get stable coins in, in the hands of people. The other very obvious class of, of applications on top of stable coin are um, Facilitate making it easier for businesses to conduct business in stable coins. Um, to overly simplify business payment flows, you've got pay ins and pay outs. Pay ins meaning customer pays business in crypto, and then pay outs is the more interesting one is business pays its suppliers in crypto. Um, the most obvious example of this would be paying Uber drivers, like stable coin payouts. So paying on only, only one, which is that new Solana app, or like OnlyFans payouts in stable coin. That's like actually a very interesting and like pretty obvious use case. Um, I think you'll probably see in the next few years, companies like Grab or other like long tail, um, like uh, basically anyone doing Uber or DoorDash or TaskRabbit or like Fiverr, all of these things, I'm fairly certain will offer stablecoin payouts within the next few years because um, their customers, the, the suppliers and the systems will demand it. Um, there's obviously lots of stuff around on, on and offboarding, you know, stable coins, you've got all these peer to peer exchanges and stuff, people like Dymo and, and Eldorado and a bunch of these other things all over the world. So there, there's some fairly obvious categories of stuff to invest in around stable coins. And then there's obviously issuers, which is like the core of it. We just announced our investment in Mountain Protocol um, a few days ago. Uh, Mountain Protocol is, to the best of our knowledge, the only team that has a regulatory credible permissionless stable coin that you can move around the blockchain that accrues yield on an auto rebasing basis every day. So meaning you have your wallet today, you open your wallet tomorrow and you have more dollars. Um, you don't have to go claim it or whatever. It just, you know, they just appear um, based on obviously the, in, in, you know, risk-free treasury rate from um, US government. Um, so those are like the obvious things around stable coins. There may be some other non-obvious sectors, but th those are the obvious ones. We have made bets in all of the above and continue to look for more. Um, on DPIN and, and DVIN networks, you know, we, we're we've been one of the most active investors generally. There have made a ton of investments uh, and a bunch recently that are not yet disclosed, but um, continue to be very intrigued. We recently made our third true D pin investment, meaning one that has a hardware component. Helium was our first, Hive Mapper was our second. Uh, I can't announce what the third one is, but uh, we did just get a deal done with them. Uh, it is in the energy sector, um, so smart grid, virtual power plant, kind of a thing. Um, and then DVINs, there's a ton of these. Most of the DVINs call themselves DPINs, which I, th I think is a little confusing. We, we internally think about those as very different constructs. Um, but the number of people trying to distribute video, anything video related, anything bandwidth related, anything storage related, certain types of compute workloads, um, these are all fairly interesting challenges to distribute. And there are, I mean, today, probably two or 300 teams working on you know, various versions of this. Um, and we're certainly pretty aggressive there. Decentralized physical infrastructure networks are a massive point of emphasis in the crypto industry today. And Helium Mobile is a fantastic example of a business that is leveraging this distribution approach. Like any network, there's a supply and a demand side. So the supply comes from hotspot deployers, while the demand comes from phone plan subscribers. Together, they create and power a decentralized wireless network that provides expanded connectivity and amazingly priced phone plans. But let's zoom in on how it works for deployers. So you get this device and you set up this hotspot, and anytime a Helium Mobile phone user is near your device, they will send and receive data through the internet using your device instead of their cellular network. The cool thing here is that you earn mobile token rewards for providing this service based on the amount of data routed by your device and how much coverage you're creating. There's also what are called boosted locations, which are directing rewards to the targeted areas that actually help individuals and businesses deploy these devices in the proper areas where coverage is actually needed based on where subscribers are. Currently, that's in LA and Miami, but soon to be coming to New York City. Again, by creating coverage, you're helping build 
a better network together while earning mobile token rewards. If providing the service is something that's up your alley, head over to hellohelium.com slash hotspot to get 15% off your indoor or outdoor Helium mobile hotspot using the code LIGHTSPEEDHOTSPOT. That is all caps, no space, LIGHTSPEEDHOTSPOT. And we'll be sure to put that link in the show notes. Starting from the top there, you mentioned getting wallets in the hands of everybody and uh, the LATAM context is really, really interesting. In the West, it feels like the holy grail moment would be like, I don't know, Apple just released that new tap to pay thing, right? If that was, if the, if you could do that with USDC on the spot, that to me, that kind of feels like the holy grail moment. Uh, Sol- Solana Saga is going the other direction of like, let's get the device in people's hands uh, rather than like the, the, where the devices already are, like getting crypto into the device. What do you think about like, what that looks like in the West for actually getting, you know, crypto rails in people's hands. Uh, I think buying coffee at Starbucks in the United States is the final frontier for crypto. I don't spend any energy thinking about that. Not relevant at all. Not going to happen in the foreseeable future. Don't spend your time on it. Um, focus on low hanging fruit, which is retail outside the U S um, the greater the industry, the better, the more difficult, the, even even industries that just deal with payouts, any any marketplace business that's dealing with payouts is like m- more interesting than consumer buying Starbucks with crypto. Consumer buying Starbucks with crypto is the final thing that happens. What do you and the firm think about RWAs? What's your thesis on those? Um, look, I'm I'm happy they exist. It's great. Uh, I think the term is mostly counterproductive because it, it is homogenizing assets that are not homogenous. Um, tokenized equities are very different than tokenized real estate, which is very different than something like parcel, which is very different than debt on chain, which is very different than mountain protocol and tether and circle, you know, USDC. So I think you need to reason about each of these markets on a, basically a per asset class basis. Um, the only RWA category that, that really matters today is stable coins. Nothing else is is even within two orders of magnitude of that. Uh, and that will continue to be true for quite some time. I think that will stop being true once stable coins eclip- eclipse a trillion and their rate of growth slows down, um, which is as a function of size. Uh, but it doesn't mean other categories can't become interesting. Um, probably the next most interesting category is US equities. Um, just because like, hey things that get a lot of press um like there you know there's there are people who want, may want to access them that cannot um i actually put out a tweet a few days ago being like hey uh, oh there was um when roaring kitty was like talking about gamestop a week ago there was like a a news cycle that said e trader was considering banning his account for manipula- manipulation or something so i retweeted that and said hey this is your opportunity for tokenized equities like y- you know so if I were to guess, I think the next asset that eclipses 10 billion on chain for like a single asset type that is like not dollars slash treasuries slash currency issued by government, um, I, I would say it's most likely to be equities um, because at least they're fun, they're interesting, they're volatile, and there are a lot of people who can't access them. Um, we're poking around there. We have not made any investments there, but you know we're poking around. Um, beyond that, everything else hard to say it's it's interesting as a venture investor again i'm very glad that people are putting private credit funds on chain and tokenizing real estate and whatever my ability to profit from that seems basically impossible so let's turn it the complete opposite way around solana currently is the center for social coins meme coins things that are not real world stuff what do you not multi-coin, but what do you think about social coins and meme coins? You know, the the more older I get, the more I appreciate capitalism and like not having the government tell you what you can and can't do and how, how things should be run. Um, so like I'm very supportive of the existence of meme coins. Fuck it, go have fun, man. Um, so far, they haven't actually accomplished anything of substance. That doesn't mean that they can't. Um, and like, hey, let's see what Iggy's doing with cell phone service. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, cool. Let's see where it goes. I'm guessing she's kind of looking at Ryan Reynolds just made a couple bill, and I'm guessing that's her her inspo. Um, 
I'm skeptical of the path of meme coin to cell phone service, but you know, like she may prove me wrong. Um, I continue to look for like ways for meme coins to become a more interesting than just strictly like speculative fun. Um, I, I have not identified a path for that to actually happen, but we continue to observe and try and make sense of it. I think Tushar said something like, this might be Web3 native gaming instead of the skeuomorphic, you know, triple A's coming on chain. Do you agree with that? There, There is something to like the the hive mind of like, hey, we're all in it together, but also like, hey, you, I'm going to sell my bags to you. And like, there's an inherent tension there and an inherent, you know, like the hive mind gets excited on the internet together. So I, I don't know if I'd call it, a, you can call it a game if you want, if you just say like, it's some fu function of entertainment. If that's the definition of game, then yes, I think I think these are games. My definition of game, I think, is a little narrower than than just like provides entertainment. To me, game is you know there's a screen and an app and like you click the buttons and there's some there's some like defined objective. Um, but you know, eyes wide open that there's no explicitly right or wrong answer there. To be clear, there are some crypto gaming teams that are interesting. I am very skeptical of ninety nine percent of them, and Multicoin is generally speaking, avoided that sector. Um, but like portals is, is interesting. Um, what third, what, um, photo finish is doing photo finish live is interesting. Um, and then what the what's it called? Parallel colony guys are doing. I think like those are really genuinely interesting. There's some, I'd say longer tail, interesting stuff happening around autonomous worlds, but admittedly, I think that is more, far more niche in what they're going for. So I'm not as optimistic, but you know, those three are the three that have like, I've caught my eye and I'm paying attention. Can you expand on why you find those ones interesting? Because largely, you know, people keep talking about on-chain gaming and like every action's on-chain and that doesn't, I can't, I can't, I haven't, I can't get, the, get over that bridge where that makes a ton of sense. Uh, but, you know, people, the idea of putting the marketplace on-chain, okay, that probably makes sense. Uh, but how do you, con how do you like put these into context and how, why do you think those ones are interesting? Um, they're all interesting for very different reasons. Uh, Photo Finish, I think is interesting because um, it's horse racing. Horse racing is explicitly gambling. And like, what is crypto? It's speculative gambling. So like, it just maps very cleanly. Um, and the team, like uh, Ian and the team, uh, this is their third iteration of building horse racing games on online. So like, they know the market, they, they know how to do it. You know, they're like the endorsed um, uh, like horse betting app from the Kentucky Derby. Uh, the whole team was just there a few weeks ago. I was also at the Derby and like saw them there. And like, you know, it, it's cool. It works. The system makes sense for that, you know, niche. Um, and it seems to be growing. I, I, I generally, the odd numbers appear to be up and to the right, although I don't know the details. Um, Parallel Colony to me is interesting because it's it's the most ambitious um, crypto game I've seen by, by far. Um, and I generally like things just as a function of sheer ambition. Um, once we, like the AI uh, boom kind of started to happen 12 to 18 months ago, a very obvious thing to go do was build a simulation of the world where each person in the world is an LLM um, or like some AI agent thing. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of teams doing this now, like inside of Unreal Engine. For, for example, there's been a lot of discussion of like airports are using Unreal Engine to model like traffic flow through. And like, I'm sure some of the people in the traffic flow are like LLMs. But the more interesting iteration of that is uh, with economics where like you've got all of these players in a system and like they they all have you know defined um economic objectives and stuff um and and obviously there those those objectives are heterogeneous and you throw a bunch of people in a room and like see what happens um that is going to happen like there's going to be some sort of large scale virtual simulation thing that we create that like is thriving that seems inevitable to me. And like given all of the sci-fi inspo from Mat the matrix and a bunch of other, you know, movies, uh, it's a, it's a sexy enough of an idea that like, it'll, it'll capture the imagination of like all the tech nerds around the world. And so I, I'm like a hundred percent probability we, we get some sort of, you know, economized um, simulation thing. And the parallel colony team, as far as I can tell is the first, you know, pedigreed team to, to try and go for it. Um, maybe too early, who knows, L tons of execution risk, tons of technical risk, really just hard with something like this. It, it is inherently path dependent. And so 
there's a real case that like the first guys do it, make a bajillion mistakes. And the optimal move is to just watch them, like learn from all of their mistakes and then like try again. Um, who, know, who knows? Love the team, Sasha and the guys, super smart. We are not investors, but like incredibly ambitious. And like, I love it just as a function of sheer ambition. Uh, and then the third uh, is Portals, which we are an investor in. Um, Portals is, uh, I'd say it's, they're like trying to fulfill the vision that probably Little Big Planet first started to go after, which is like a tool set to create a game in a game. Um, Roblox is kind of the other thing that's in the same bucket, but Roblox is like, it's um, simplified to the point of like really lim limiting. And obviously that was by design. Um, Roblox is really trying to push the boundaries of like a game that lets you create any arbitrary game uh, strictly with visual tools. Um, th that to me is, strikes me as like fairly important. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the crypto part, they are like, look, like we need an on-chain economy or, or like we need, we need economic tools in the ability to create arbitrary games. And it was just very natural for them to use crypto rails for that. Um, so, so like really focusing on complete permissionlessness, complete openness that, that struck me as pretty important. So those three games are, are interesting to me for extremely different reasons. Um, but, but they all have elements that are cool. Going back to meme coins, something that's happened is they've given rise to a lot of financial activity on chain, especially in the form of MEV. The other day, Solana Foundation announced that they'll be pulling stake from those who do private mempools to sandwich retail, which received a lot of, let's say, straw man and misconceptions. But... I think Tushar commented saying something like this is kind of the proof of stake security model in practice. What are your general thoughts on that whole ordeal? Non issue. I mean, it's like, dude, uh, I'll actually I'll give a more, a more important framing. Um, proof of stake systems are explicitly political in a way that proof of work systems are not. Um, proof of work systems are somewhat political, meaning if you are a miner and you are allocating to a mining pool, and you, for whatever reason, disagree with the operation, you know, the values or the operations of mining pool, you can redirect your hash power elsewhere, or you can obviously just mine on your own, which economically is pretty stupid, but you know, you have the right to do so. So proof of work mining in, is in theory, perfectly objective in practice, almost perfectly objective with like a small amount of politi politicization to it, but it's, it's like very minimal. Proof of stake is not that. Proof of stake is explicitly political. Um, because the people who own the stake are in, have inherently like different beliefs, um, and they live in different countries with different regulations and stuff. Um, and, and like, moreover, like delegation is a reality for all proof of stake networks. Ethereum doesn't codify that into the protocol, which is just stupid because then you just get Lido and Coinbase and Binance and all these other weird things that are just like funky and like just, just unnecessary complexity and silliness. Um, but like you have to recognize proof of stake systems are inherently political and people should move their stake if they disagree with what their validators are doing. So I very much support their decision to do so. I, I think where maybe the, 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 you know, the negative reaction comes from the ETH side on this is they're saying, oh, this is your way of like fighting MEV, you know, malicious MEV actors. This is never going to work, which that argument is like correct in theory, but like you're, they're just like over extrapolating the importance of the foundation's actions. Like the foundation's actions just represent a near-term political decision to like not support people, which is fine. And that doesn't preclude all of the other stuff people are still trying to do to deal with MEV on chain. Like all of those things continue to progress, right? So it's just like a complete straw man um, criticism. I believe you once said that MEV is the primary value capture of an L1. Do you still believe this? How have your thoughts evolved? And if so, can you explain that or why you believe that? Uh, our views have not evolved. Tushar gave a great presentation on this at the 2022 Multicoin Summit. It's on YouTube. Um, but that, that view is, remains unchanged. Um, the, the core view and the simple version of it is, look, if you are uh, staking tokens in a proof-of-stake network um, and there's MEV, then searcher and assuming you have searchers who are you know uh optimist selfish and economically rational people then like they will bid up fees and stuff to uh, to go after the mev um and that will be uh captured some of that will be captured by 
the validators and the validators will pass pass those yields back to stakers because that's that's like built into Solana that they have to. Um, so so objectively, that is a mechanism of value capture that exists. The primary question that has existed and continues to exist and and will exist kind of sort of forever, but we, we, it's going to take probably three to five years to have real clarity around it is what is the distribution of that MEV between the L1, um, between searchers, between apps, um, and between like other middleware things. So like most obviously would be like Pith. Um, like they have like their OEV thing, which is basically like backwarding as a service. Um, and it's unclear what the distribution of um, MEV will be, MEV profits will be across the different kinds of parties. I can make arguments today um, uh, like that those things break down in 25, 25, 20, 25, 25. Roughly, I can make arguments for 70, you know, the rest 30, kind of different ways to think about it. I, I don't have a particularly strong view on how that, that breaks out, um, but eyes wide open that there's a large amount of variability and and where those profits grew. And when you're thinking about transaction fees, I think I think it was a recent episode on Empire. Actually, you know, I think when you you said you're when you're you're modeling these things out, you write transaction fees down to zero. Can you elaborate on that? What is the cost of a signature verification plus a state update plus storage for like one node? And if you really think about that, like the electricity cost of all that. If you really think about that, it's like extremely close to zero. You know, you're talking fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a penny. Um, and like, yeah, you multiply by, call it a factor of 10,000 to replicate that across the network. But like, you know, one, a millionth of a penny times 10,000 is like still a thousandth of a penny or whatever. So like, I just like these numbers are close enough to zero that I treat them as zero. And Nielsen's law and Moore's law guarantee that those numbers will go down over time. Like they, they will asymptotically approach zero. So it just like model them like for the purposes of being a value for evaluation, um, just like the conservative assumption is just treat them as zero. Understood. Okay. And so the idea then being it's all about priority access to state, like that's what drives value. That That's the only thing that matters. Gotcha. Okay. And then when you, if we look at those two numbers today, was, Ethereum and Solana are largely the only places where there's meaningful MEV capture happening today. And so if we use those two as an example, uh, there's like a, Let's round here and say Ethereum's a four hundred billion dollar protocol, FTV, and a Solana's a hundred. Now there's a, there's a four x gap there, and if you look at the MEV capture and priority fees on both of those chains, there's not a four x gap. And some days it's even. Uh, I I would not really I'm not I'm not going to say Solana has you know permanently eclipsed that by any means, but it is more in the conversation than any point in history for any chain relative to Ethereum. How do you think about this from like the valuation standpoint of like? Is the market mispricing this, or is this just like not an understood principle? Uh, like when you see the, the differences in those two gaps, like what, what comes to your mind? There's a three hundred billion dollar relative valuation mispricing. <laughs> I like that. That would be the very quick answer to your question. Um, the the more nuanced answer would be: don't think the market appreciates this. Huge amounts of back bias. Huge amounts of people not paying attention. Huge amounts of people who just like don't think about these concepts. Um, I do think this will be one of those things that's slowly than quickly, um, meaning at some point there is going to be a, in a fairly short window of time, like call, it'll probably be a one to three month span in which kind of every, not uh, a huge percentage of the market is going to say, oh, wow, like it, it, it's the, the flipping is real, meaning solely, not meaning ETH, BTC. Um, and, and that will happen in a fairly condensed period. I don't know when that will happen, but I, I do think it will happen. And then when it happens, it will be it'll be pretty quick. My friends, big, big news. Blockworks is hosting Permissionless 3 in Salt Lake City this year. So we're heading west for three days starting October 9th. Permissionless is our industry's premier DeFi event that brings together crypto natives from all over the globe. I've personally been the last few years and can honestly say that the attendees are incredible. It's people who actually care about crypto. We'll also have more than 200 industry titans speaking at the event. And this includes builders like Lucas Bruder from Gito Labs and Brian Pellegrino from Layer Zero, or investors like Kyle Samani and Joe McCann, and even elected officials like Representative Tom Emmer, who is fighting the good fight in Washington. And it's narrative season, so we're going to be covering the seven hottest themes in crypto. This includes things like modularity and restaking, or Bitcoin and L2s, and even AI and crypto. The goal is to keep you up to speed on major developments in the industry. 
ticket prices will be structurally increasing over time. So get your ticket today. For my Lightspeed family, I got you. We're going to use code LIGHTSPEED10 in all caps, no space, for 10% off your ticket. All right, everyone. I look forward to seeing you at Permissionless 3, and let's get back to the show. There was a recent episode between Justin Drake and Tolly about a bunch of things. But maybe tying this back to the previous point, the issue of issuance came up. And people all over the place don't know how to classify this, don't agree on how to classify it. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, I remember the last thing I was going to say, and then I'll answer your question, Mert. Last thing I was going to say is, actually, we have told our LPs in our LP communications, we expect Solana will uh, meaningfully eclipse Ethereum on all relevant metrics by the end of the year. Right now, it seems like maybe neck and neck or maybe like 20% kind of delta roughly, but like, you know, pretty close. Uh, but we're on the record with our LPs making that prediction. And so I'll go on the record with the podcast too. Um, to answer your question, Mert, what do I think about issuance? Um, so the, the, the problem with Dr Justin Drake's framing of it, th there's like two fundamental assumptions he's making that are incorrect. One is that the price of the asset is arbitrary um, or rather that the asset itself is non-productive. In the case of Bitcoin, that is true. Bitcoin is not a productive asset. It does nothing. Um, and moreover, like miners very explicitly are attacks on the system. Like they have electricity bills, they have to pay them. You, you know, like th that is clear. Um, but like the system is is non-productive. Um, so th that's like a fundamental difference um, in, in what these assets do. Um, I guess just to, to, you know, take Justin's side on that, he'd say, well, eat this money. And I'm like, okay, well, you can call it commodity money if you want to, but like the, the even the mechanism by which your system achieves commodity money status or it becomes ultrasound rather is via this burn thing. And the reason people are bidding up transaction fees is because of MEV, because it, it's a productive asset. And right, right. So like you, you can't, you, you can't decouple these things. Um, I, I do think it is fundamentally strange to have money being a productive asset. That, that, that also strikes me as like fundamentally weird. Um, th there really isn't an example in history where, where money is a productive asset. Um, money has always been commodities or debt. Um, and obviously today dollars are debt, debt in this case to the fed. Um, so that, that's, that's one miscon and, and, and so, sorry, the, the relevance of that to the issuance is, well, yeah, if you just think the price is arbitrary, then miner selling or staker selling is bad because like that's driving the price down. But that, that's assuming there's no notion of fundamental value. My, my, my whole premise of like why I like productive assets over Bitcoin is because they have intrinsic value, which is based the function of their yield. Now, you and I, we can all disagree on rate of growth rates and discount rates and all that other stuff, but like objectively they have yield. And so the point is, is that if there is a forced seller, that should not matter in the long run because that means that if there's a forced seller, the price is coming down, which is increasing the yield for someone else so like the asset is finding its its true price as a function of the market's perception of yield versus cost of capital and risk. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's a fundamental misconception that, that like Justin, I think, doesn't understand here. Um, and to be fair, totally didn't express that in those terms either, but uh, it, it is like financially correct. Uh, the other major difference here is like the cost of, uh, who who is bearing the cost of issuance? And again, Justin is his frame in which he answers the question implies it's Bitcoin. Meaning, you are a BTC holder, and there are people mining, and there's new coins being issued, and they are selling, and so like you are bearing the cost of of their selling by the price coming down. Um, that is again true in a proof of work context. That is not true in a proof of stake context. In a proof of stake context, you can just take your coins, um, and you are guaranteed to beat the rate of inflation. Justin tries to steel man that by saying basically taxes is his argument. Um, and like, I have two, two problems with that. First, the vast majority of people in the world are not in America. And secondly, there is tax classifications that like you can make an argument for that, uh, these assets are property. Basically chick chicken laying an egg is the, the, the simple analogy here, where if you own a chicken, chicken lays an egg, you're not taxed on the value of the egg until you sell the egg as a farmer. Um, same, I, same, like I hold the same view here. These are assets of property, not income. Um, so yeah, like. Uh, issuance here is misunderstood. And, and then the last related point to issuance is people just look at Solana, they say, oh, it's $80 billion, $100 billion market cap. Inflation is call it 5 or 6%, something like that. So I do some simple math and they say issuance is 5 or 6 billion per year. Th that's like 
grossly inaccurate representation of like actual selling pressure, so to speak. Um, the reason is like stakers are just taking money away from non-stakers. Um, the correct way to think about like the cost of running the network would be to then take total issuance and multiply that by the average validator take rate. Mert, I'm guessing you know what that number is approximately. And I would guess it's roughly five or 6% is probably um, average, you know, take rate for validators. I know a lot of uh, y'all are at zero and a bunch of folks are moving towards zero. So that number is coming down. Um, so like the, the cost of running the network is, yeah, is, is not five or 6 billion. We're talking on, around 1 20th of that number um, and quite possibly. And I think that that's going to go down in percentage terms fairly quickly. The other thing that came up as a result of this is, and we were already talking about FTV, economic security, right? And Tolly likes to go on many interesting changes about this. So does everybody. I am curious what you think about economic security and if you think people have gotten it wrong. Uh, yes, people have gotten it wrong. I think both Tolly and, and Drake get it wrong. Um, again, let's go back to kind of like history is a helpful framing here. The reason people originally talked about economic security, and then let's start with proof of work because it's Bitcoin. It was the first one was because of 51% attacks and the risk specifically was a reorg, right? Um, it turns out that that's really overstated in practice. Like even if you have a three hour reorg, the only people who really are at risk are exchanges. Like, yeah, it's, 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 and, and exchanges need to deal with that in terms of their policy of like, you know, how long do they wait to take an acceptance? Um, but like that, that, that's why we have this construct. And, and the problem specifically in Bitcoin is technically you don't have finality because a reorg could happen at any time. And like, look, if someone makes some crazy new ASIC chip or there's some quantum computer, like there may very well be one fucking massive reorg. Could be 50 blocks, could be 5,000 blocks. Like who, who knows? That risk is non-zero. It's obviously very close to zero, but it's non-zero because there's no notion of finality. Once you have finality on a blockchain, then the risk of uh, economic security just collapses. Because if you know this transaction is finalized as of, call it five seconds ago, then like it's finalized and there's no risk that it's going to be reverted. Um, so like when I think about economics, like when I think about like what, what, is the, what, what is the guarantee a user wants, the guarantee a user wants is this transaction is final. And, and that's true for both the sender and, and actually more importantly for the receiver. <laughs> the receiver wants to know this transaction is final. Um, because once they know it's final, then like they can do what they can credit your, your account if, if you're an exchange or they will give you the coffee if you're Starbucks. Um, and, and so like the most important variable from a, you know, user experience perspective is just latency is, or exp exp explicitly time to finality. Like, and like that, that, that by far is the most important thing. And I, I think that's just like empirically clear when you think about it through that lens. Now, then there's a the follow-on question, which is, what are the risks around the transaction coming to finality? Um, but like here again, this is like weirdly circular, meaning on a Solana, there's an expectation that transactions are finalizing on a rolling basis, call it every, I don't know, five seconds-ish. Like maybe it's two, maybe it's 10, whatever. But it's like, it's on the order of a handful of seconds. Um, on Ethereum, the answer is 12 minutes. Like consensus tells you guaranteeing the answer is 12 minutes. And, and so... What's interesting is like, look, if you're going to attack Solana, like assume you've got whether it's a third of stake or two thirds of stake, uh, I guess it's a third of stake. That way you could like disrupt finality. Well, like everyone in the world, if, if blocks are not finalizing, then everyone in the world will know that and they will know something is wrong. And, and so like you, you stop, obviously, like if you're, if you're an exchange, you stop crediting customers accounts because <laughs> you're like, you know, you're pinging Helios and you're like, hey man, like is the money arrived? And you're like, I don't know, maybe. You know, you don't have received two thirds yet. And, and so like, I, I just don't really understand what the attack is for economic security. Now you could say, well, what's the cost of, you know, getting to a third? And like, that's a function of market cap and liquidity. I don't really understand the economic motivation though for getting there. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. When when all of this, when all of the, the meat space social systems are under the general assumption that finality happens on a rolling basis every few seconds, when that reality is disrupted, then everyone raises their hands like, hey, what the fuck is going on, guys? Like something is wrong. And like now everyone's on high alerts, you know, and, and so like they stop accepting th things as final. So 
Yeah, I mostly agree economic security is a meme, but I think neither Justin nor Anatoly ca captured correctly. There is something to be said, just to maybe steal man a bit more, that you will interrupt liveness, right? So you will halt the blockchain. And if you halt the blockchain... If you have a third of stake, yeah, if you have a third of stake, you can obviously prevent transactions from finalizing. Yes. And I believe, I mean, I'm not even sure the exact attacks, but like the Vanek guys, for example, talked about some Oracle attacks that you could do and maybe cause some liquidations and stuff. Do you think that's realistic? Um, look, it's these these are all possible things for sure. Um, I, I, look, I would venture to guess on neither Ethereum nor Solana, any of the derivatives teams or or liquidation teams have written their logic to account for an extended reorg or an ex, or an extended you know lack of finality um, because it's not perceived to be a near term threat. Acquiring a third of stake and having the sophistication and willingness to act on it and being able to produce a profit on the other end, given slash like weird exogenous slashing risks and who knows whatever other weird compounding things happen. It, it, it just seems kind of like, I mean, we have, t we have spent a lot of time internally thinking like, how would we do this? And like, we can't get there. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, again, look, I could be wrong, but like it's doing it profitably is basically impossible not because of like the limits of the chain, but because of all of the other social realities around liquidity and economics and exchanges and and y y like making all putting all these pieces together and the sophistication required to pull this off to be pretty extraordinary. Um, now you can say, well, what about a um, attacker that's not motivated by profit? Um, you know, so basically at this point you're talking explicitly in the world, world of governments. Um, yeah, I'm just not worried about that. Governments don't seem to perceive these things to be a threat. Even like governments that you might think, like the Chinese government, that might be particularly hostile, their view seems to just be, let's just ban our people from owning it. And they're like, okay, you know, America, Europe, whatever, y'all go do whatever you're going to do. The, they certainly don't view these systems, at least not today, as, as a threat to, to their sovereignty. And that may change in the future. And like, you know, I, I do think these systems need to get hardened over time, but it's just not something I think is relevant today. Right now, the thing that's relevant is like make the systems more usable and have more stuff happening. And by the way, all of these systems are hardening over time. This actually is to a, a, a very important point, which is the Ethereum people always tend to say if there are centralization vectors in like how consensus is designed or the block producers or, um, you know, like people negotiating things off chain, like there's these concerns that like the system um, is centralizing naturally. And I think we have empirical proof that like that doesn't matter because like Solana from inception was flooded for centralizing blocks are too, you know, block producers are too big. Oh, jump is going to run the whole thing. And Alameda is going to run the whole thing. Like this has been like the critiques of, of it from day one. And what we've seen over time is that this has been true for the three largest chains, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana is that as the chain grows in market cap, Everything decentralizes. Um, the user base decentralizes. The validators decentralize. The number of clients de decentralizes. The political control over the system decentralizes. Remember Bitcoin in the early days, dude, there were some like hard forks and shit. Like, and it was, you know, like at one point there were like, yeah, a couple of reorgs and stuff. Ethereum obviously had the DAO fork, whatever, whatever, right? Like, so all of these systems decentralize on basically every metric over time. Um, the only caveat I'll put is like centralized sequencers on Ethereum, but we, we don't need to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, but like they just do. And why is that true? It's not like magically true. It, it's, it's true for the very obvious empirical reason of as market cap goes up, that means more people care. And that means more people are doing stuff and different people show up and do different things because they have different skill sets and different interests. And so, like, these systems decentralize just organically. Um, and, and so I just find, like, that kind of entire class of logic to just be, be silly. It just, it just doesn't meet the, like, way the world works test. So the reason I asked about economic security is to segue into this next question from one of your tweets. And the tweet is, Multicoin is likely the largest holder in the world of tokens that could be eligible to be AVSs in the world. And then you list a bunch of names. And then you say, 
I've never heard anybody say, Kyle, I think one of the primary things limiting our growth is the amount of quality of liquidity backing the crypto economic security of our system, not once. So it seems you are maybe not so favorable restaking. Is that, would that be like, what are your overall thoughts on what's been happening on Ethereum? And then furthermore, you're also an investor in Gito. How do you think it maps to Solana? Um, I had my first call with Shriram when he was raising the seed round, I don't know, two, two and a half years ago. I told him, I don't believe you're solving a problem. I, to this day, believe restaking is not solving a problem. Um, furthermore, I believe that all of the discourse around restaking dramatically fails to capture the um, uh, intangible costs or immeasurable costs, which are social in nature and are, are quite substantial. Uh, I have a joke that I, I've shared on publicly a few times, which is that the the goal of a blockchain or the goal of any of these systems is to minimize social coordination as you scale. Um, and my biggest my biggest like fundamental problem with AVS is is that they just increase social complexity. And the more people who use AVSs, the more the like you have like compounding effects of social complexity. Um, and so I, I, I really much hate that. Um, so yeah, I don't like it. No interest in it. Um, you know, today Gito is not a restaking system. There's been lots of discourse that Gito will do restaking. Um, great if they do. I don't particularly care. Um, I, you know, we still own our Gito tokens because like they do the MEV stuff and they have the the like best um, liquid staking token for it. Beyond that, I don't care. Yeah, no, that that's a fair point. And I like your your comment there about complexity, right? If we look at using some native stake, there's some native using native stake, I think there are some interesting things you can be you can do, such as giving pre-confirmations to base roles trying to use uh, Ethereum as their sequencer. That's an interesting way to decentralize the sequencer, given the you know, you pointed out earlier, that, like having a single centralized sequencer is a problem. The, um, the correct solution to that problem is not that, it's Solana. 100% like, agree. You're just reinventing you the just wheel. You all these problems and you're like, ah, oh, with all these restaking, we can like, it's just like, no, man, like this is too fucking complicated. Uh, it's going through this massive lift of additional complexity to avoid shortening block times, right? Like that, that is literally what's happening, uh, which makes me wonder. I mean, the core ethos that sits at the heart of Ethereum is prioritizing the sol solo staker in the name of increased decentralization. And like that decision or that mindset has driven the entire design decisions. I'm not saying that's good or bad. That's just an observation. Uh, yes. Whereas Solana has taken a different angle and these other high th throughput systems as well. The question is like, where on that trade-off spectrum do you start with like, hey, on day one, we're going to have a more centralized system that will scale into decentralization. For me, I guess like what, at what barrier can you define sufficient decentralization? Is that like a node count thing, Ge geographic distribution, client count? Like what kind of qualities do you look for to have to be like, okay, this, this system is sufficiently decentralized? Um, Balaji wrote probably like the right blog post on this um, in 2017, um, calling like how do we measure decentralization or something like that. He has, I think, six measures, if I recall correctly, and they're like node count, number of client implementations, I don't even think he has Nakamoto coefficient or block producers in there. Maybe he does. Um, I forget the other variables he even includes, but like there's a few things you can look at. Um, I don't think there is a right answer. Could you construct some sort of like polynomial, like six variable curve here? Like, yeah, I think it theoretically is possible. And I think that like, you know, I think today normal people, most normally people look at Solana and they say like, it seems sufficiently decentralized. Um, I, I think that is the view that most people in the market view of Solana today. You can gripe about, you know, fired answers not here yet and stuff, but like, I, I think that's generally accepted view. Um, Ethereum, I think, you know, is accepted on that view as well. Um, interestingly, Bitcoin only really has one client that matters. Um, and people is also, is also accepted that Bitcoin is even more decentralized than Ethereum, which is like an interesting thing. Um, you wouldn't have expected that given how much Ethereum prioritizes client diversity. Um, so I don't have an answer for you other than to say there is like some sort of like six figure polynomial curve here that you could do to like add up to some minimum threshold number. No one is ever going to define that with any mathematical precision because it's unnecessary. I do think kind of intuitively everyone is like 
roughly doing that math and adding it up to see if it crosses some threshold. Again, th this isn't literally happening with a calculator, but like it just is kind of clear when, when you get there. Um, so, so it's not a good answer to your question other than like you kind of, you know, you know it when you see it. Okay. Final question for me. Uh, going to shift gears. You're obviously an investor. You've seen a lot of people build things. What is something you've noticed uniquely that crypto founders get wrong? Um, I joke that every disagreement we've ever had internally is a function of differing time horizons. And I think this maps into crypto, specifically what founders choose to work on in a very weird way, which is like things get hot and then the founders choose to commit their lives working on it. And, and that's like fundamentally a misunderstanding of how to think about strategy and, and time. By the time something is, is hot and it's like being discussed, if you aren't all, already haven't been building there, like then you are by definition at a, at a disadvantage because it's becoming hot because other people have been building there. And like that really bothers me. You, you know, now look, it's okay to be late to the party if you then if you have some unique insight and you're like, no, 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 look, ZK is cool. It's all the other people are wrong. For this reason, I figured out some new math circuit. It really is like a breakthrough. It's really 50x better. If you're that guy, like awesome, you know, great. In fact, I would argue Anatoly roughly meets that characterization. Anatoly was not early to crypto. Um, he only observed it because he's like, what's this Ethereum thing? What are these ICOs? And I, oh, okay, like I can make it better. Um, he like wasn't a crypto ideologue, right? And, but he was like very clear about like why it was, it was like substantially better. And like, I don't know, I'll highlight like account abstraction of like, there was this wave like 12 months ago where like some EIP was passed or whatever that was like, oh, account abstraction is here. And like, there were like 20 startups that raised money to build account abstraction. I was like, guys, like, wh what are you all doing? Like, um, so yeah, once, once a sector is being talked about, you should not start a company in that sector unless you really are very clear about like why your views are different. Well, I can't help but bring up rollups and L2s here because from a valuation angle, we see a lot of like comparative valuation in, in this industry. And I think that's largely because historically fundamentals have not driven any type of valuation. And you know, we're seeing L2 after L2 launch at a hundreds of million FDV. We've seen like failed DeFi product projects kind of make this pivot and be like, hey, we're launching as an app chain for all these benefits. Um, and then they get this like valuation boost. How do you think about that? Market can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Don't short. Is that just a product of being uh, a nascent market, as, as still a young market? I, I think that's part of it. I, actually, here, I'll, I'll make the flip side, which is, I mean, my we, we are not expressing this trade at all, but my intellectual belief is that L2s are dramatically undervalued and L1, Ethereum is dramatically overvalued because I believe all the value comes from the MEV. Ethereum is explicitly foregoing the MEV and giving it to the L2s. And they're like, yeah, but we provide economic security. And I'm like, dude, economic security is nonsense. And like, I mean, look at look at Arbitrum. Like they're the most active um, L2 DAO. They just approved a $250 million gaming fund, which is like the most egregious capital allocation decision I've seen in the history of crypto. Yes. Um, and um, like, especially given the evidence we have over the prior three years, like leading up to this moment in time, it's, it's just like so fucking atrocious. And I think the number is $10 billion has gone into gaming and we don't have a single game. Sorry. It, it, yeah, there's, there's just like, there's just clearly nothing to show for it. And, and obviously like, the decision to make a fund to invest is not based on some unique insight, right? Um, and and so, but my, my bigger takeaway from that is the token holders of our Arbitrum are like they live in a different fucking universe, <laughs> and like they can be convinced of anything. And so, like I expect there will be an activist campaign at some point that whether it's in three months or in four years, I don't know. And someone's going to be like, guys, why are we paying Ethereum? This thing is nonsense. Like, it fucking finalizes in 12 minutes. We have a new system that finalizes in four seconds. Like, you know, you, like, for, or fork, fork, fork Celestia in two years and, like, make it our own. And like, I don't know. Some weird thing like that is going to happen. It's going to go through governance. 
And like one of these things is going to pass. I'm not saying it's going to be the first one, but it just seems inevitable to me, given what we have seen of specifically this token holder community. Like, because like the guys who are arguing to do it are going to say, what the fuck is Ethereum providing for us? Like, you know, they're just paying these guys all, look at all this money we're paying them. And like, you, can, you, you can see the political campaign already. 100%. It's funny you bring that up. I, I've been, something I'm starting to get louder about is just the idea that tokens sitting in a DAO treasury are not real. They do not exist. They have yet to be issued. And that mental conception of like people viewing their, the DAO treasury as being like well capitalized or a bucket of like real dollars is entirely false. Um, and for the first time, I think we saw a meaningful change in a very small change with, with ZK Sync. So they're not minting the tokens into a, a, an address. They're being held like unminted, which is a very, very, very small change. But the, the, I think that has a massive impact on the token holder psyche of like, oh, no, we have to actually mint these tokens into circulation if we want to go pay for employment or you know, fund some initiative, no, no matter how silly it may be. That very small change, uh, I think, actually is going to play it a pretty massive impact uh, on how these DAOs are run. Um, I, I agree. You're, I, I don't appreciate exactly what behaviors are changing and like what defaults are changing, but obviously some defaults are changing and that will impact um, net capital allocation decisions. Okay, uh, final question. Solana L2s, thoughts? They will launch. Don't think they're going to have a lot happening. Um, I'll add one clarifying point, the, the term L2, um, the term, look, the, there's a bunch of research people who argue about like semantics of bridges and like what's an L2 and stuff. I think as users perceive L2s, L2s are functionally equivalent on, the, on Ethereum to the L1 because you have the same contracts deployed and you have the same assets and you even use the same metrics like TVL and trading volume and stuff to talk about them, right? Um, so L L2 means L1, but kind of sort of cheaper and faster. This, that's what normal users perceive. Um, and that is like the Ethereum definition of L2. Um, there are certain, certain teams like Eclipse and Movement Labs and others that are, I'd say, like bringing the same concept to Solana. And they are calling themselves L2s because they like, generally speaking, you know, meet that same definition, right? Like as far as normal users are concerned. Um, I think the more interesting opportunity for Solana L2s is doing things that Solana L1 cannot do. Um, and so like I think of these as like ways to extend Solana um, in certain ways. So I wouldn't call them L2s. But I think like what Drift is, is working on, what Zeta is working on, what Grass is working on, um, there's probably some other teams I don't, I don't know about. They're all building systems that like, they do live on top of Solana in some way, but they are not L2s in the way that Arbitrum and Optimism are L2s. Um, and I think those are, are, are quite interesting. Um, and I think designing yeah, these novel systems that extend the functionality of Solana will be, will be pretty powerful. Kyle, fantastic episode, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Anything you want to leave the audience with? Uh, no, guys, look, super fun. Glad to be back on the show. Dan, thanks for having me, Mert. Appreciate you being here. Good to see you, by the way, a couple weeks ago in Austin. Uh, hopefully you move here. It seems like you're excited to get out of Canada. So uh, hopefully you come down to Austin. Yes, sir. Awesome. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, guys.